but you see what I mean, just the usual um, initial state for a fair quantum flip. So this is one over the square root of two, and again, one over the square root of two. And if you then apply this uh, to, to the definition, the Born measure on the spectrum will just be the 50-50, uh, depending on who you measure. And uh, this is a special case to keep in mind, but it, it's also a bit misleading. It, it only covers single measurement and it misses the beautiful general picture. And the beautiful general picture is the following, namely that the Born measure is the restriction really of the state to a commutative C star subalgebra. That this language, if you don't know, I, I think about half of the people in the uh, audience will know what this means and the others don't miss much, except that they are hopefully now inspired to learn this language. Uh, so if you actually restrict this state initially defined on, on B of H to the commutative algebra generated by A and the unit operator, so that's commutative isomorphism, which makes this commutative C star algebra isomorphic to the continuous function on the spectrum of A, which is a compact set in the real numbers. And you apply the Ries isomorphism of measure theory, stating that uh, states on compact spaces are the same as probability measures on X. Then you have it then you have what I claim. Uh, if, you, if you assume these two identifications, then the Born measure simply is the restriction of the state to the algebra generated by A. So for me, the, this view is, is an example of what I call borification, where everything with empirical significance is, in quantum theory, is sort of formulated in terms of commutative subalgebras of the algebra of all bounded operators, which is non-commutative. And this is a very neat example. And that means, uh, so the Gelfand isomorphism, the Ries isomorphism, they're most, the two most canonical things in functional analysis, insofar as Hilbert space theory is concerned. And so the, the, there's no way around the Born measure, I would say. It's incredibly canonically given by the mathematical setting. Uh, on the downside, or one could say, this is why quantum mechanics is interesting. Uh, so the, the Born measure has no empirical meaning. And this, I think, is the genuine difference between quantum theory and all other uses of probability theory in the world, where I think single case probabilities can be defined by betting averages or betting strategies or betting averages and Dutch book theorems and so on. Uh, for the Born measure, you cannot do this. I think all, all these attempts are, well, meaningless. Uh, so I took the point of view, which I actually learned from the paper by Callender, who attributes it, I think, to, to David Lewis. Uh, it's simply a construction given by theory, and, and the role of experiments is, is to sample it in a way I will make increasingly precise. So the Born measure is a purely theoretical construction, and uh, it, it has no significance for single case experiments. That, that's what I believe, although my views don't really uh, rely on this, but, but that's what I think. And by all means interrupt if you disagree, except if this gives very long discussions. So I once gave a talk and then uh, uh, Tim Moss. Uh, yes? Um, I'm not going to disagree um, because I still don't actually quite understand the claim. I, I'm, I'm just wondering if you can say a little bit more about it. I'm not sure what you mean by saying it has no empirical meaning. As um, such, as a single case probability. I think you, you cannot uh, define it in terms of uh, betting strategies, propensities, all, all this means nothing, I think. But let's postpone this till the end, okay? Okay. Because this is a very broad question. What I was going to say, I, I once gave a talk and then Tim Maudlin shouted, yeah, so what does quantum theory mean? <laughs> and uh, yeah, that, that's not <clears throat> my answer during a talk. Okay. So the, the, uh, the, what I see as empirical tests are sort of, the, the, the mathematics of them are summarized in, in one theorem, which I prove uh, in the paper dedicated to its host, a randomness, what randomness, also earlier versions in my book. Namely, the, the following procedures for repeated identical uh, independent measurements are equivalent in the sense, in, in a probabilistic sense, in giving the same outcome space and the same probabilities. Namely, either you can apply quantum mechanics to the whole run uh, described via uh, von Neumann's tensor product and see this as a single experiment with a single Born rule applied to a single observable 
which records the outcomes of all the individual experiments. You can actually do this. Or uh, you can apply quantum mechanics to each single experiment. Uh, think of just this quantum coin flip. Uh, record the outcomes classically and then combine this just using classical probability theory. So in fact, it's the second procedure that is usually taken, but it's justified by the first one. Uh, I would say. And either way, uh, so the Born probability for single outcomes in, induces the infinite Bernoulli process probability on, on the infinite product, uh, the infinite Cartesian product of, of the spectrum. So the spectrum of A, the A, the, the operator you're measuring uh, to the power N. So by the Kolmogorov probability theory, that there is such a measure induced by the single case measure. And that's in fact the empirically significant thing. Although at the end, so near five o'clock, we'll discuss what it actually means to have infinite outcome sequences. But, but just postponing that part, it's not infinite product measure that actually has empirical significance, I believe. And the case to which we will apply this is this uh, space. Uh, so two here means uh, the bit. So two means the, the, the number two as defined by von Neumann, namely the set with elements zero and one uh, as possible outcomes. So I just use minus one and one, just think of these as zero and one. So the space of binary sequences uh, describing uh, an infinite repetition of a quantum coin flip. And so that's an example. And you see, in fact, from this theorem that this uh, quantum coin flip has the same probabilistic structure as a classical coin flip, as long as they're both fair, which, uh, in my humble opinion, does not exist. So I, I don't think there actually are classical coin flips or fair classical coin flips, and we'll return to this as well. So uh, one corollary, which I would call uh, a sampling theorem, or it, it's an example of an ergodic theorem. It's also an example of the strong law of large numbers. Uh, namely, if you take any measurable subset of the spectrum, now in the general case, uh, and you take any uh, outcome sequence of this infinitely repeated uh, experiment or measurement, then almost surely, which means with probability one with respect to this uh, infinite product measure, uh, if you actually uh, ask whether the first outcome lies in the specified set delta, uh, yes or no, and, and you add this through the experiment and take the limit, then you reproduce the measure uh, of delta. And uh, so in sort of earlier naive uh, literature, this was an attempt to define probability or measure. We now know that you can't do this, but you can verify it. So given mu, so mu must already be defined. This is not the definition of mu, it's mu is already defined and then you have this result. If mu were not defined, you couldn't even state the corollary because it's, it holds with probability one with respect to the infinite product of mu. And another significant result uh, due to Martin Luff, uh, as I mentioned already last time, so in a fair coin flip, either classical or quantum, because they have the same probabilistic structure, uh, any outcome is one random almost surely. So the, the, this is the basis of applying uh, the Born rule to, to experiments. And uh, the, then there are two ways to think, or at least two ways to think and proceed. So, so one way is uh, to think about quantum mechanics in the way that uh, you could say scientifically uh, uninformed people think about classical coin tossing. So that, that's the people Newton always refer to as the vulgar. So if you read uh, Newton, it's, it's this strange Y-E vulgar, ye vulgar, but, but it's, I think the vulgar. So the, the vulgar think about coin flipping as a, as a random process. And then so one way, which was the way uh, Born and Bohr and Heisenberg and von Neumann and all these people defended, was that they, these people may have been wrong about uh, classical coin flipping, but the vulgar are right about quantum coin flipping. There's something genuinely random. And the opposing view is that uh, the vulgar are wrong even about quantum coin flipping, namely there is an underlying deterministic theory as in classical coin flipping. And this has given rise to the literature on hidden variable theories, and especially to well, there are even there are two camps, one proposing these theories and the other sort of trying to refute these theories. 
And in the refutation tradition, there are also two sub-traditions or two camps, also uh, very polemically opposed to each other, almost like the Bohmians. So a tradition one started by uh, the great von Neumann is that uh, even much short of a deterministic theory underneath quantum mechanics, even value assignments are impossible. And so the idea is that if a value assignment is a map, uh, let's call it lambda, it's often also the name of a hidden variable, which maps, uh, say, quantum observables to the real numbers. And it's subtle because one has to leave room for the value of the map not only to depend on the observable it's initially applied to, the one called A so far, but also to possible contexts. Uh, which mathematically are identified with um, algebras or other operators uh, commuting with the given A. You can specifically think of, if A is not the maximal operator, uh, think of a larger commutative subalgebra or a family of, uh, of operators commuting with it. So a so-called contextual, contextual assignment uh, has lambda depend not only on A but on contexts. And you exclude this contextuality or not. But so the, the, this tradition one started by Van Norman tries to exclude the possibility of, of even value assignments if they satisfy certain desirable properties. And if you can't even do that, then certainly you can't have a theory uh, underneath it. And so uh, Van Neumann uh, stated the first theorem, which is very neat, it's not difficult for, for someone like him, but it was conceptually highly significant. And the, um, the desirable properties, uh, so he excludes, is that this value assignment is uh, non-contextual. Uh, so this should say non-contextuality, I'm sorry about that. Um, it should be non-contextual, so the value of the map only depends on A, it should be linear, and it should be dispersion free. So lambda of A squared is lambda of A and then squared, so the dispersion is zero. And that, that's a good theorem, much derided by, uh, by Bell and his, uh, his friends, which is uh, extremely unfair because this opened the way to an entire literature to which Bell even contributed. Since the next refinement, uh, usually called the coaching specker theorem and called the coaching specker Bell theorem by fans of Bell, is just a refinement of it. It keeps the same conditions except that linearity is now weakened to linearity on commuting operators. And then the proof is infinitely more difficult. It's, it's done by the geometry of frames in the sense of orthogonal axis in R3. It, it, it's very, very nice. It's related to the work of Escher even. Very beautiful. And then the next step, uh, which is this so-called free will theorem, uh, which is almost, I would say, is completely uh, already in an early paper by, by Haywood and Redhead. It's in the paper by Stairs, it's in the paper by Brown and Svetlichny, it's in the paper by Clifton, but it was made famous by Conway and Cochin. So some people have the ability to attract attention. Yes, maybe I should leave it at that, but, but their work was known, but because they called it the free will theorem, it became much more, it, it got a lot of publicity. And in fact, it's exactly in the same tradition. So it excludes uh, value assignments that are dispersion free, linear on commuting operators, but the contextuality, the non-contextuality condition is weakened to context locality. So the, the value of uh, the observable A in, in an assignment lambda is allowed, in fact, to depend on operators nearby. And th this is all done in the EPR or the EPR BOM or bipartite apartheid setting. So you have Alice and Bob and the whole show about that. And so the idea is that the, um, the value of A uh, may depend on other operators commuting with uh, A at Alice's side, if also A is Alice's operator, but not on operators at Bob's side far away. So context locality is a good word for that, I think. I learned it from Michiel Saving. And, and more technically, the outcomes at Alice's side of the experiment are independent of the settings at, uh, at Bob's side. So it, it's literally in this tradition. And in fact, the free will theorem uses the coaching specker theorem as a lemma. And uh, finally, and, and this is uh, some sort of an injustice uh, as well. Uh, so Conway and Cochin, 
if they added anything to this earlier chain of papers is that they stressed the role of free will uh, without analyzing or formalizing it at all. So you in fact have to infer from their proof what they mean by free settings. And also philosophically that their comments on free will are, are, are very amateurish, I would say. I'm sorry to say this since Conway has died, but uh, there, there, there's something wrong with the fame of this uh, of this theorem given the early literature. So what they um, added it wasn't even right, I, I would say. Sorry, class, may yes. I, if Martin allows, just ask about the third black uh, bullet point. Yes. Uh, context locality is, I think, a good name, but also it's local contextuality, isn't it? It's an allowance for contextuality. That, that's right. An operator in your neighborhood. Yeah, I agree. So, so, it's so good. local contextuality is, I think, an even better. Yes. So I'll, because this it's is really a contextuality that's being limited to be local. That's right. So a context locality should. It, it's even better to call it local contextuality. Exactly. An improvement over saving. Thanks. Uh, done later so th th this was the main point of my paper with Kator. Uh, Esfeld worked on this, uh, my former student Ronnie Hermans. Uh, there's a recent sort of pair of papers by Sen and Valentini on the archive w which look very good. So, so they, they seem to give a complete analysis of this, uh, what this should mean. All right uh, then tradition two uh, at sort of um, polemic union with the other one is that it's not so much value assignments that are challenged or the possibility thereof, but this tradition tries to exclude deterministic hidden variable theories, uh, satisfying certain desirable probabilities once again, but they're excluded now on probabilistic, purely probabilistic grounds. And so one of the things that started this, uh, this game was the De Broglie-Bohm theory. Uh, which reproduces single case Born probabilities by construction uh, is claimed to be deterministic, but is non-desirable, so to speak, in being non-local. Um, then sort of this became mixed up with the, the famous EPR paper, which you could say was the first analysis of the relationship between entanglement, locality, and determinism, uh, including Bohr's uh, infamous reply to it. And then Bell, so I, I learned, so next week or so, there, there is a whole workshop uh, organized by Jacob at Harvard, an online workshop about the history of Bell's theorem, so let's not say too much, but I think it's fair to say that, that Bell asked himself, uh, in the light of the De Broglie-Bohm theory, whether non-locality was a necessary property of deterministic hidden variable theories, and his answer was yes, but he sort of overlooked or misinterpreted uh, the assumption of freedom of choice or freedom of, of settings of experiments exploited by it hoved and uh, this has to be mentioned because it hoved uh, in his deterministic cellular automata theory underneath quantum mechanics was really derided for many years because his theory obviously conflicted with bell's theorem and then he was one of the people i think to put this on the map that, that there was this hidden assumption about free settings uh, that his theory doesn't satisfy it, as we will see. And then I would say uh, there are claims uh, that Bell proved that nature is non-local full stop without any refinement of what non-locality means or without any assumptions like determinism of realism. Uh, th these claims are boulder dash. And this is a word I learned from Michel Janssen. So I'm uh, simultaneously writing a book about uh, rel general relativity and black holes for students. And then I, I wrote about one of Einstein's arguments in favor of general covariance that it was bullshit. And then Michel answered, no, 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 you, you cannot say that. Uh, and he, he had learned from John Ehrman to, to boulder that. Claims are boulder dash. All right. Okay, if you then compare these two theorems, and I, I spent a lot of time doing that, then they basically have the same implications, uh, but, but they're sort of different in, in, in the way they use their assumptions, they, they're technically different. So Bell uh, is about, so I will not give the details of these theorems, I already hardly have enough time to say what I want to say, but, but my uh, randomness paper contains an appendix spelling this all out, and it's all in my book as well. 
So Bell is about two level systems. Uh, the free will theory is about three level systems. In the case of Bell, uh, in a way, it's sort of more favorable because his, theoretical, his, his use of the Born rule or his, say, quantum mechanical computations can in fact be replaced by optical data or data from optical experiments in, in a long chain starting with Alain Aspect and ending in the Netherlands with the, the final experiment in that series by Hanson and Hensen. And also they're robust against perturbation of the initial state. Uh, on the other hand, they rely on, on classical probability theory. So th this, I would say, is an assumption, since classical probability theory is a theory with axioms, and so it's a, it's a choice. And uh, there is some discussion whether this is just using standard mathematics or whether this really assumes something, which I think is the case. In that sense, the free will theorem is stronger in the sense that it, it doesn't use any probabilistic reasoning. But also it's less robust, it's more vulnerable. Firstly, it's purely theoretical, so there are no experiments actually backing the quantum mechanical computations, although I think no one doubts they're correct. And it relies on perfect correlation. I mean, one of the improvements of Bell over EPR was to remove this, this dependence on perfect correlation. But it uses no probability theory. And then the link with philosophical free will uh, so again, it's not given by either Conway and Cochin or, or at Hoft. Uh, there's a very good master thesis in philosophy, uh, which you can find on my website by someone called Davide de Melo, who are supervised together with two philosophers, which I recommend. And, and there's much more literature, but, but this uh, de Melo is, is very good. Unfortunately, he became a consultant afterwards. All right, so the, the joint conclusion of these two traditions, although so some people know this and others don't, they're on very polemic footing, especially tradition two, the Bell tradition, has done uh, everything to deride uh, von Neumann and the tradition he gave rise to. But ironically, they come to the same conclusions. Um, which I will state uh, in, in this way, namely if a hidden variable theory is just asked to reproduce a quantum mechanical, what are called so EPR correlations, through these sort of uh, joint uh, probabilities. So psi is, a, this is all uh, bizarre because these hidden variable theories use half of the quantum mechanical formalism, so, or, or all of it even. They use wave functions, they use operators seen as observables and so on, and then they start doing classical things. But in particular, they, they suppose that there is a quantum mechanical state, psi, say the, the PR initial state, and they're trying to produce the quantum mechanical computations uh, giving, so the, the, this is standard notation, but for those who are new to this literature, A and B can be seen as observables to be measured or as parameters in a one family of observables to be measured. A is on Alice's side, B is on Bob's side, and X and Y are the outcomes. So X is an outcome of Alice's measurement of small a, Y is the outcome of Bob's measurements of small b, typically a binary, so x and y could be 0 and 1. That's enough to cover the whole argument. And so a hidden variable theory uh, attempts to reproduce this, firstly by given functions, uh, p sub lambda, where lambda is the hidden variable that's supposed to be what is missed by quantum mechanics, and what is often seen as a classical variable. Uh, so there is a classical or hidden variable lambda that actually sort of rules the world, which is not known in quantum mechanics. And the link with quantum mechanics is given by averaging with respect to some probability measure uh, determined by this quantum mechanical state, which is supposed to be known. And, and this will play a huge role, this measure. And um, so the, the, the outcome of and Bohm and Bell and EPR tradition is that if this is what a hidden variable theory produces, so it gives these conditional probabilities and it gives a probability measure for each relevant uh, quantum state, psi, then the conjunction of the following four properties is inconsistent. Firstly, determinism, meaning that the, uh, the joint conditional probability theory uh, probabilities just take values zero or one. They're also 
which I think is a completely meaningless exercise, uh, stochastic hidden variable theories, where these are again probabilities, but uh, in deterministic hidden variable theories, so th these are either zero or one, so, right? Uh, and the, the second point is the, the Born rule, which means that the quantum mechanical conditional probabilities are used as given by the Born rule, via the Born measure. Then context locality or local, what did Jeremy say? Lo lo local contextuality. Local contextuality, yeah. uh, which means that if you, uh, th th there are two versions, one from the point of view of Alice, which is that if you sum over Y, so this P sub, uh, sorry, th th this should be lambda instead of psi, uh, P sub lambda X, Y summed over Y, so Alice's measures X, and it doesn't even know about Bob perhaps, uh, with settings A and B uh, is independent of B and, and likewise when X and Y are interchanged and A and B are interchanged and free choice. And, and the, the, this uh, means sort of superficially the independence of the choice of the measurement settings from the state of the system one measures and the, this is subtle. So in the case of Bell, which is a probabilistic uh, theorem, this means stochastic independence for the free will theorem it's in fact quite tricky to, to formulate this well. And th this was the accomplishment of my colleague uh, Kator, in fact, to see how you have to, to, to do that. But in any case, uh, the, these theorems and say uh, 80 years of research sort of converged that uh, this combination is impossible. And so deterministic hidden variable theories have to pay a price. And then there are four ways out. So if you have a contradiction between four things, uh, well, then one of them has to fall, or even more of them. But so the minimal ways out are, uh, I would say the mainstream physicist choice would be that determinism falls, so uh, the, the vulgar were right about quantum mechanics. The Bohmians would say that uh, local contextuality falls, at Hoofd will say that free choice falls, and Valentini uh, would say that the Born rule falls. Which I, is the point of view I have the most sympathy for, in fact. Now, what I will uh, defend, in, in fact, uh, the time that remains is a sharper theorem, uh, which doesn't allow these two loopholes. Namely, there are simply two things that are inconsistent. But you have to sort of increase your demands on what is meant by a deterministic theory. And so what on the previous slide, I think, is asked of a deterministic theory is simply not enough. It, it falls far short of determinism. So what I would say is what a deterministic theory should do is the theory should state, indeed, it should state these probabilities, uh, well, quote unquote probabilities, because they have to be zero on one, which simply means that the hidden variable and the settings determine the outcome of the experiments but it shouldn't only do that, it shouldn't, so what, what happens here is given the hidden variable, the outcome is known if the experiments are named, are stated. But what it should also do, I would say, it should state the value of the hidden variable per run of the experiment. So it should, the theory should specify a function, let's call it S, from uh, the real numbers which index the experiments, so experiment zero, experiment one, experiment two, into the space of hidden variables, capital lambda. And more generally, uh, T should simply state the outcome of each experiment. Uh, and if it provides such an S, as we will see, that's what it does, because in a deterministic hidden variable theory, lambda determines the outcome. So if you say, per run of the experiment, what the hidden variable lambda or the hidden state lambda is, then also the outcome is clear because of this other property of determinism. And this is, I will claim, incompatible with the Born rule and especially its consequence of uh, one randomness of generic outcome sequences. And so uh, it is to be noted that um, sort of compared to standard literature on hidden variable theories, I ask more. Although I can't see how a theory could be called deterministic 
if it doesn't do what I ask of it, namely to state the value of the hidden variable. So what people typically do, uh, as I mentioned on the preview said, they state a probability measure averaging over which reproduces the predictions of quantum mechanics, but it doesn't actually specify the way this measure is sampled. It just assumes that stating the measure is enough and it, does, uh, it asks no further questions. And I will just do, uh, well, maybe I will skip that part, even uh, the, the proof uh, for, for the two case studies of Bohm and its Hove to each exploit a different loophole in Bell and free will. But the general point is very simple. And in fact, it was emailed to me by John Ehrman, having seen my first talk and, and read my uh, FQXI essay. The, the, the whole point is very simple. So namely, if the description of this outcome sequence uh, given by the theory, again, I claim a, the a deterministic theory has to give that description. If that takes place in any sort of usual mathematical setting, such as ZFC, um, then even a single one random outcome is uh, outcome sequence is impossible, let alone a generic set, uh, because by Chaitin's incompleteness theorem, these sequences can have no explicit description in an axiomatic setting like ZFC. Whereas the deterministic theory is supposed to provide exactly that. So the, the, this is the core of the argument. It's vulnerable at one point, which I will discuss. And uh, let's just very briefly go through the case study. So in, in quickly, so in Bohmian mechanics, the, the hidden variable is position. So space of hidden variables is Q, capital Q, which one could see as the Q of a many particle system. So R to the power three N if you like. And so you actually need functions that given the particle configuration, give the outcome of a binary measurement. And it also should give, uh, as I claim, a function that for each run of an experiment states the value of the hidden variable, namely should say where the particles are which is what the Bohmians don't do. They just say the particles are distributed according to the Born measure. Because in this case, and it's similar with the Hoft, uh, the probability measure, which sort of is a generic thing in hidden variable theories, in the, Bohr, in the, uh, the Bohmian case, this simply is the Born measure, or one could call it the Pauli measure. And likewise in the Hoft, so the Hoft uh, interpretation, uh, so his hidden variable labels the uh, basis vectors in the Hilbert space. So he's very close to quantum mechanics. And again, his uh, compatibility measure, now a function simply of n, so the Hilbert space is supposed to be separable, is also simply the Born probability of n given the quantum mechanical state uh, psi. Now, if you compare that with standard quantum mechanics, let's say, broadly Copenhagen quantum mechanics, then the difference is that uh, quantum mechanics leaves individual outcomes to nature. And in particular, uh, this, uh, what, this should be X, uh, it does not factor through a space of hidden variables. And the essence of all deterministic hidden variable theories is that this outcome sequence does factor. So in hidden variable theory, uh, so at a given run of the experiment, so at some natural number N, there will be a hidden variable that has a value and decides the outcome. So that's what it means that X factors. And in quantum mechanics, there is no such factorization. This is simply undescribed. Measurements have outcomes and that's the way it is. And so I would claim that if a hidden variable theory does not in fact state the value of the hidden variable in a given experiment, then, then nothing is gained over quantum mechanics except a story of some kind, but, but mathematically or physically, I would say absolutely nothing is gained. And in particular, you can't say that such theories are deterministic, that there's just something lacking. And, and, and nonetheless, uh, both the major, uh, well, I see as the major hidden variable theories, the Bohmian theory and its host theory, and I would say all the others, they, they, they fail to do this. Again, they're satisfied compatibility measure which in the case of Bohm and Hoft is e even equal to the Born measure. And then they say or assume that Q uh, in the Bohmian case and N in Hoft are distributed according to this measure. And they're done. I'll just switch on the light. It'll be with, um, it's getting dark here and maybe you can't even see me anymore. Hang on.
All right. So uh, the, the the sharper theorem. So if sharper, I would mean I, the the outcome is sort of more binding, but it also sort of it's it sharpens the notion of I would accept as a deterministic hidden variable theory. Uh, the sharpening of this assumption is that, so uh, as I said, the deterministic hidden variable theory is now supposed to specify the sampling. And I would say, equally well, you could say it simply specifies the outcome sequence. Because again, the passage from the hidden variable to the outcome of the experiment is, is supposed to be known or given by the theory. So in Bohmian mechanics, if you give the particle distribution, then they will tell you what the outcome of any measurement is. And now the easy case, uh, almost trivial, is that if determinism is taken to imply computability of this outcome sequence, and this I, I don't think is the case, and I will get back to this in the next slide, then since uh, computability of the outcome sequence excludes the possibility that it's one random, then no outcome sequence can be one random, and hence the deterministic theory cannot reproduce even one. This is the argument I just gave. Uh, cannot even reproduce a single outcome sequence, typical of QM. So that's the easy case. The, the more difficult case, I would say the general case, still remaining to be clarified somewhat, is that T, being a deterministic theory, should at least describe an outcome sequence. And so what is meant by a description in this case, uh, I will get back to and is sort of unclear. But Assuming we will describe this in logic, what it means for a theory to describe an outcome sequence, any sort of reasonable definition of a description should have the implication that if, if the theory is deterministic and hence its description, then the outcome sequences it describes, um, they, they cannot be one random because by this, this is the point, by Chaitin's incompleteness theorem discussed last week, uh, only finitely many digits of a one random sequence actually can be stated or can be described. Whereas again, a deterministic theory, whatever the logical meaning of the notion of description might be, it should describe the sequence. It should state its, its contents, its zeros and ones. And this is impossible by, by Chaitin's theorem. And again, you have a, a similar contradiction as in the computable case. And therefore, the theory cannot reproduce the, the one randomness property of typical outcome sequences, uh, which in itself is a corollary of using the Born measure to describe outcomes. And, and that's the proof. So it's almost trivial. It, it lacks all the subtlety of, of Bell's reasoning. It has sort of the coarseness level, maybe of the free will theorem. Assuming Coach and Specker, which is very deep. But once you know Coach and Specker, then the kind of mathematical reasoning of the free will is that's not difficult at all in a way. However, there's a, a vulnerability, um, and maybe that's the last thing we should discuss. Uh, this proof requires more detail about logical descriptions provided by deterministic theories. And uh, so I looked at the literature trying to relate determinism to computability. And again, uh, a good starting point is Ehrman's uh, Primer on Determinism. Uh, chapter 11 is all about this. Then there is a book uh, also cited very often and well known by Poor L. and Richards on computability and analysis and physics, which is relevant. Uh, but but I, there's other literature, but I would say it's in, inconclusive. So I, I would say the, the link between determinism as thought of by physicists and computability as thought of by logicians uh, is unclear. And in particular, more research is needed which description uh, deterministic theory provides of, of binary sequences. And so my first uh, hunch uh, was wrong, but it's good to describe it to see the second try. Namely, I would say a naive generalization of the idea that deterministic in the setting of binary sequences means that the sequence be computable. Well, what's the next sort of describable thing? Uh, that's the notion of arithmetical. And to, to see this, uh, so there are many ways to think about everything, but uh, especially about binary sequences. So a binary sequence, so it's, it's a function from the naturals to the bit, zero, one. 
And you can identify this with a subset of the natural numbers in an obvious way, namely the characteristic function of the subset is the inverse image of one. So it's just S contains the natural numbers where the sequence has one. And uh, the, then by definition, there, there are various definitions that are equivalent, but one of them is that uh, the, the subset is called uh, arithmetical. If uh, it's described by a formula in piano arithmetic, standard number theory as done by logicians, uh, by the, the property that N is an element of the subset, if and only if uh, the formula Psi is true at the value of N in the usual interpretation of uh, piano arithmetic in the usual natural numbers. And so the, the, that was just one shot and it's immediately false because Chaitin's halting probability, this is an, a famous number, uh, at least it was made famous by, by Chaitin in the same sense that the free will theorem was made famous by Conway and Cochin. Uh, th th there is a, a number, I will not review the definition even, but it's, the, it's, it's a simple case where you can not explicitly, but sort of implicitly describe a one random number. And that number, so the omega, the whole thing probability, is, so it's the sum, uh, you, you take a fixed universal prefix free a universal Turing machine, and it's the, the sum over all uh, finite strings uh, where U holds, so is the sigma is accepted. Uh, weight with two to the minus uh, sigma, which it can be seen as the probability of the string. So it, it's a probability, you can show it's between zero and one. But in particular, uh, Chaitin himself and many people after him showed it's one random, and yet it's arithmetical. And uh, this is not even so difficult to prove. So the, 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 this can't be right then. So the, the, this deterministic uh, the identification of deterministic with arithmetical is wrong. But you can refine the argument, and all this is extremely naive and only meant to be a first shot and uh, for opening the floor to discussion. So this, uh, this, this class of arithmetical subsets, S, can be sort of ordered uh, by the so-called arithmetical hierarchy, uh, whose description you can find in, in books on computability. Uh, it's done uh, through what well, it can be done in many ways, but, but one of the ways to do it is to actually classify these formulas psi that actually describe the subset, the subset by the blue, uh, the blue uh, formula. Uh, so in logic, one shows uh, so any formula in first order logic can be brought in pre next normal form, which means that roughly speaking, all the quantifiers are to the left, and then uh, it's just there, there is an order. So the, the lower the number of quantifiers, the, the closer you are to uh, the computability of S. So the lowest case is where, in fact, um, psi is equal to a four. Uh, quantifiers are only bounded quantifiers, and that's the case if, if S is uh, computable. So that's the case, let's say, already rejected. Then the next step if, is if there is one existence, existential quantifier, and so on. And so um, what might not be so bad is in fact uh, replace the uh, very rough idea that deterministic is, means computable and the equally rough and wrong idea that deterministic means arithmetical, which is far too broad by sort of the, sort of the lowest case you can have avoiding the counter example which is that you could say that the description X comes from a deterministic hidden variable theory if and only if S is in this lowest class sigma one. So in logic books, they will have a, an upper suffix zero as well, ignore that. Uh, which means that uh, the, the formula Psi uh, has a single existential quantum or, or many of them. So the amount of existential uh, quantifications, uh, it, it doesn't matter because you have a sort of computable isomorphisms between n to the power p and n. So you could have an arbitrary finite number even of existential uh, quantifiers, as long as you don't have for all universal quantifiers. And so if, if you conjecture this, then the sort of this has the right feeling because this means that there is a hidden variable or there could be 
many hidden variables. Again, you, you can increase the number of existential quantifications uh, as you like and stay in the same class. So that, that, that sort of suggests that, that the variable is hidden and it avoids the Chaitin counter example, but it's only a, a very, very first idea. And again, uh, so the, the proof I gave is incomplete in the sense that I haven't really settled this and uh, th this should be subject of further research. Again, the question is what it means for a deterministic theory to actually describe logically an infinite binary sequence and, and these are some possibilities. And it's only if I feel really satisfied that we have found the right class in logic that the argument would be completely ready as far as I'm concerned. All right, so it's five past five. Um, so one claim I gave, I will give very briefly uh, again, is that classical coin tossing is impossible actually by the same kind of reasoning a classical coin, a classical fair coin is impossible, I mean. So the vulgar uh, do not realize that the outcome of a coin tossing is simply given by the initial conditions, namely the vertical velocity of the coin and its rotation speed. And there's a third variable, the wobble, so to speak. But you can only get a 50-50 fair coin if, if the sampling of n, so the nth toss, uh, so the initial conditions for the nth toss is done randomly. And again, that cannot be done in a deterministic theory. So that, that's another example of the same kind of reasoning confirmed by experiments by, by, by many people, uh, especially Diakonis is I think, the main person who also promotes this view for, for completely different reasons, I, I think. Sorry, so in fact, what, is, what is QRNG? Quantum random number generator, sorry. So the, the illusion of randomness in coin tossing is that um, the higher the vertical velocity and the higher the rotational or the angular velocity, so the, the closer the, the, the regions of alternating outcomes get to each other, so the less control you have over the outcome. And so the 50-50 um, illusion of a fair toss comes from an averaging procedure, but that doesn't free us from the obligation to state for every throw what the initial conditions are. And again, this cannot be done in a random way if the underlying theory, for example, the theory of the person doing the toss is deterministic. Okay, and so finally, and then I'll shut up and we, we, we may have time for discussion, which of course I hope. So are our deterministic hidden variable theories sort of excluded now? And in fact, this is not so clear, and we're almost in the setting, I mean, that this overstates the case in a way, uh, vastly, but, but we're almost in the setting where uh, it is true that deterministic hidden variables theories are excluded, but it's unprovable. So it's almost a Gödelian, but this is a romantic view situation. So the, the, the technical question, could a deterministic hidden variable theory ever be falsified by finitely many experiments, or as emailed last quantum mechanics produced one random outcome sequences. Excuse me. And I would say the evidence is thin and the ensuing uh, falsification of determinism may even be impossible in principle, except at a purely theoretical level. And there are all kinds of bears on the road. So firstly, this is related to Ehrman's principle as reviewed last week, namely about the role of idealizations in physics. And the idealization in this case is the, the fact that we work with infinite sequences, whereas experiments are finite in number. Well, th this is uh, one of these things that will drive you crazy, but, but any finite outcome uh, string, however long and however random in the sense of Komogorov, it could be completed to a one random sequence. For example, by adding or concatenating a one random sequence to it. And, and all the, so the, the, the initial stuff is irrelevant once you add an infinite part. Then, uh, even if you focus on the finite initial part, sigma, uh, then it's lack of compressibility. So suppose you were you wanted to prove it's Kolmogorov random, which is a concept defined for finite strings. Anyway, it's, it's hard to do because this Kolmogorov function is not computable. So it, it's, uh, I don't know if it's impossible to do, but at least it's hard to do in a physics setting. 
and also, and then Chaitin's uh, incompleteness theorem strikes back in a way, it's hard to give counter examples. So if someone comes up with a theory and has sort of a, an ocean of outcome sequences uh, produced by his or her deterministic hidden variable theory, then so points A and B it make the case already weak, but it's also impossible to state the way it should be because you cannot prove any example so even if you have a quantum random number generator and even if it were possible to give an infinite output sequence you could not state that these are one random so you cannot in that way defeat the determinist because you cannot show the way it should be so that, that is awful but nonetheless uh, worth discussing i think another way uh, to save deterministic hidden variable theories is to give up the born rule and this, our way, as far as I understand, because I'm not part of their world, this is the split among the Bohmians, who really write very, very unkind things about each other. Uh, so that there's one camp is the, the, the canonical, so Dürer, Goldstein, Zhang, that is apparently a famous paper in, in the Bohmian literature, uh, whose validity is denied by Valentini. Uh, so the, the Dürer, Goldstein, Zhang, and their followers simply claim that that it's you shouldn't discuss this even. So the Born rule is a quantum equilibrium condition. It's an axiom of the theory, and that's the way it is. Uh, Valentini uh, is sort of looking at this from a statistical mechanics point of view, and he says, well, uh, there's also non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, so there should be non-quantum equilibrium Bohmian mechanics. And so he has all sorts of uh, examples and computations where initial conditions either do or do not settle to quantum equilibrium. And in particular, and this is very wise of him, I think he is open to the possibility that the Born rule may be wrong or may not be the case, in fact, may not be a fact of the matter, maybe an approximation, maybe an asymptotic case, but, but uh, he, th th this is very good about Valentini. And I think it's the only way to save Bohmian mechanics, except by Bohmian, by making it a stochastic theory, which is, I think sort of defeats uh, the purpose, at least uh, historically. So for those who know this literature, I would say Dürer, Goldstein and Zhang uh, blur the issue by talking about typicality all the way, but they don't at all mean typicality in the sense that I used, as in sampling a probability measure, they mean restrictions to subsystems of the universe. So the theorem they're very, very proud of is that if you have a wave function of the universe that gives rise to uh, the Born rule, then this Born rule is sort of imposed on every subsystem of the universe or with probability one. And th th that is completely unimportant for the issue I'm discussing. So th that says nothing about the need to sample the probability measure, for example, of any of their subsystems. And my view to stop uh, is that the Born measure is emergent from more basic theory. It's not emergent as Valentini has it from non-equilibrium Bohmian mechanics. It should come from some other theory, but that can't be quantum gravity because quantum gravity performed uh, or done uses quantum mechanics in its strict way and actually assumes the Born rule. So that, that's never going to give a new or interesting perspective on the Born rule. And I'll stop there. Just I'll leave the conclusions open. Uh, and uh, so maybe uh, there is some time of discussion uh, for discussion. I'm sorry, I'm a bit over time, but hopefully we can stay on. Well, let's thanks class for a wonderful, wonderful talk. Thank you. And uh, let's get straight to it. Questions. There's a raised hand system. Jacob has a question. Thanks so much, Klaus. That was a fantastic talk. Uh, thank thank you. you so much. I learned a lot. It was great. Um, so I have two questions. One is hopefully a very quick, narrow question. I'll ask that one first. Um, on your slide with the two traditions of, uh, I don't know, no-go theorems, no-go sort of perspectives on hidden variables, mm -hmm. um, I'm just curious where something like the GHZ no-go theorem lies, because it's... Yes, so the, the, the G, uh, I'm trying to find... Because it's, it's a, it's a one-shot, non-probabilistic... Yes, uh, so no the... Uh, uh, it, it, it falls in, in tradition one. So G E Z, uh, one could say it's a much simpler, it's a, tri, a tripartite argument. So the uh, so tradition one, let's see, 
Um, so tradition one uh, in the hands of von Neumann and Cochin Specker is a sort of one with the unipartite case, it's about single experiments. And then EPR added the bipartite perspective and one could say the GHZ uh, added the tripartite perspective and then it falls squarely into this uh, into this it's, tradition one. It's, it's, it's lumped say. with the other tradition just in the sense that it's usually uh, uh, regarded as a statement about non-locality, right? So it, it's often yes. lumped together with, with the belt. Yeah, but, but non-locality is, is part of this. So, so once you go from the single to the bipartite or the tripartite case, locality and commutativity uh, at the distance will become an issue. But there's also a sort of a political fact that people in the second tradition, except uh, especially the one who typically shouts his opinions, claim all valid results for their tradition. And so I, there was in fact at the at Hoft, and Jeremy was there for example, at the at Hoft conference, uh, in honor of which I actually wrote my first paper here, there was a PhD student who, who pointed out uh, to him that GHZ and similar results fall into this earlier tradition. And he shouted back, this was completely wrong. And it was all a special case of Bell's reasoning and so on. So there is a political aspect that I, I would prefer to avoid, but I think GHZ uh, tries or successfully proves the impossibility of value assignments. And as such, it's squarely in the von Neumann tradition. I was hoping my, my question would, would be quick, but your answer was very rich and detailed. So I'm going to, well, I'm going <laughs> to save my, I'm going to, it was fantastic. I'm going to save my second question until after. Uh, All right. Thanks, Jacob. So Eric had his hand just after. <clears throat> so, uh, Klaus, it seems to me that there, that in the in your theorem, and um, in any kind of theorem that goes along the, the kind of route that you're that you're mapping out, there's an issue about how you pick what sequences you're going to apply the test of one randomness to. Um, so, so consider the the, the, fo the following wildly implausible, but still in some sense the word possible scenario. It just so happens that every single time we do a string burlap experiment using silver atoms, the silver okay. atom always goes up. Mm -hmm. Silver atoms behave exactly the way they normally behave everywhere else. You know, if you have a, if you have, if you have a lump of silver, it, it doesn't you know, spontaneously dissolve. Silver behaves like silver everywhere except in string burlap experiments, where they just always go up. Mm -hmm. Every other string, every other string burlap experiment you ever do on other stuff behaves like you'd expect it to. Now the question is, what is your what sequence are you going to choose to apply your test of one randomness to? If you only if your sequence is stern burlap with silver atoms, clearly it's not one random. If your sequence is all stern burlap experiments, probably you can get one randomness, I'm guessing. Yeah, um, although uh, th th that's a good question, but it can already be somewhat undermined that even in the, the usual case, the stern gerlach case, as I said, you cannot test for one randomness. Maybe that would have been a better way of phrasing the slide I had in response to Ehrman. You cannot test for one randomness. The question is, certainly, is even more difficult than you might imagine. Can, so you can't test for one randomness? Well, not that I know. And, um, but the, the issue though to me is that by cherry, it, it, I worry that by cherry picking, even if we allow it in principle, in infinitely, infinitely long sequences, and we allowed people just to count and manually check, in some sense of the word, yeah. whether or not, by, by, by cherry picking, we could always get non-one random sequences in principle. Yes. Yeah, so the, I think this relates to the discussion we had last uh, week with uh, Carl Hofer, for example. Um, how to deal with low probability results. Because your example, so this crazy behavior of silver is sort of a low probability outcome, isn't it? Uh, which in any finite uh, run is, has probability low, but greater than zero. And, and so it, or is this not the context in which you ask the question? So one no. way of reading it is what to do with low probability outcomes, or is that not the way you that's, mean your that, question? That, that, that's a part of the question, but the question I'm asking is, is slightly larger, which is you, you talk about sequences of experiments as though they're this kind of, na as though there's this, this kind of natural kind. 
We just, yeah. just automatic. What we mean by a sequence of experiments is just kind of naturally picked out by the physical world or something like that. But it's not. It's experiment. It, it, it's experimenter's choice, and it's our choice. What do we mean by a sequence of experiments? But the, so now you mean it in the loophole sense around Bell's experiments, where, where people sort of, or is that not the context either? Or I'm, ta I'm talking about your, I'm talking about your theorem. Your, th your, your theorem makes reference in its set of assumptions to sequences. Yes. Must be understood as sequences of experiments. I want to know how it is you define what counts as a sequence of experiments and what doesn't count as a sequence of experiments. Ah, uh, but here I, I was very naive. So I, I would say that there is an sort of agreed upon setting for the initial state for a quantum coin flip, a fair quantum coin flip. There is a professional experimentalist who carries out one experiment after the other and writes down the result. And, and this is something you don't, you, you think is too idealistic. Is that the question? That, that's what I think. No, no, very I'm, naive view of experiments. So Mar Martin can shut us down when we go on too long. But um, if, 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 if people think that I'm beating a dead, I'm being a dead horse in mouth of water. No, but what's wrong with that answer? I think the, the standard picture a theorist uh, has uh, of a lab. Uh, I, 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 have not, I have no problem with that whatsoever. Uh, as a as as a pract as a pra as a pragmatic philosopher and as in as, let's say as some, someone who respects experimental science profoundly, I have no problem with that. But that is not something I I know how to logic I know how to logically formalize. And you seem very intent on having a really a really clean, thoroughly formalized uh, uh, theorem. No, so that there is a path from practice to to formalism. I see what you mean. Yes, uh, so this is a. So you're saying the idealization is not only in assuming we have infinite sequences; it's already in drawing outcomes of finite sequence. This is already an idealization where we make choices, select mm -hmm. bad runs, and so on. That's the context, and yes. then I have no good answer. But this is almost Nancy Cartwright, like let's go into the lab and see what they're actually doing, isn't it? And I, I, I personally, given my own philosophical predilections, think that's probably the right thing to do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let, Stalemate. Let's maybe come back to this. Uh, Jeremy has a kind of follow up on this kind of point, but uh, I see that Carl has his hand. So why don't we have Carl and then we can come back to Jeremy's point. Um, if Jeremy's is a kind of a follow up, why don't we stick to that first? All right, Jeremy, go ahead. Well, okay. If you, thanks, Carl. If you're sure, uh, this is not so much triggered by Eric, but hearing Eric's line, it resonated with what I thought to myself as I heard the talk. Super talk, but concerning this requirement that the theory should not merely postulate that the Born rule be sampled in each trial, but should specify the function from the natural number into it, when you first said that i thought hmm an ambitious deterministic theory that is a theory of the whole world might be required to do that but there is this uh, uh more modest idea that they would normally uh, advocate and it reminded me of those arguments either in StatMech or indeed in the pilot wave tradition about mixing you know those arguments along the lines with that whatever it's called the BGKY hierarchy that yes. with sufficient mixing and with a sufficient time gap between trials on a statistical mechanical system you can sort of prove that it is a so-called Bernoulli system now, admittedly, there's always the ultimate microstate, and thus the deterministic actual history. But, uh, you know, this, this line of thought is a bit like Anthony Valentini. I totally resonated with your endorsement of him as against Dor Goldstein Zangi. Um, but there is a kind of 
general line of how to think about what a deterministic invariable is meant to do, which is a bit more modest than being a theory of the whole world and allows a few mixing arguments to justify the idea of sampling the Born rule from one trial to another. Yeah, I, I doubt that asking of a deterministic hidden variable theory to state the value of their hidden variables per experiment amounts to asking them to give a theory of the whole world. I'm just asking them to give a theory of each experiment that they claim to describe. And then I agree, so the, the, this I disagree with. And then the second part I do agree with, that there could be sort of a dynamical mechanism reminiscent of Boltzmannian sort of ergodic theory like argument that actually gives that, that shows that the sampling is done automatically in time. But yeah. they don't give such arguments as far as I know. And certainly uh, Dürer, Goldstein and Zangi don't, and, and none of the later literature I'm familiar with. Yes, but but I, think, I think you're yeah. putting uh, your finger on the wound, uh, as we say in the Netherlands. Um, this is the whole issue. So, so as, as long as uh, hidden variable theorists will deny that this is a fair condition to be put on a deterministic hidden variable theory, I have no claim. But I don't see how they can deny this. Right. What does, again, determinism mean? And again, what do they gain over standard Copenhagen quantum mechanics if they leave the sampling to nature, if they don't actually state what the value of their lambda is per experiment. And, and I, I must say, I had this conversation with uh, at Hoft after my talk at his meeting, and he, he mumbled something like, well, that's in the initial conditions, and you can't ask a theory to, to state its initial conditions. And, and this, I think, is not impressive. Since again, if, if a hidden variable theory doesn't even state the outcome of individual experiments, then what does it gain yeah. over quantum well, mechanics? Well, yeah, I mustn't pursue this because of time, but I would, I, I suppose a pilot wave theorist would say there are aspects of our ontology or interpretation which have, you know, it, you've got the non locality, you've got the uh, the, the refutation of some traditional folklore about the existence, the non-existence of trajectories. They would, they would urge that even if they are, you know, uh, unable to do what you ask of them. And I, I resonate with you that it, it's a reasonable thing to ask that they should do it. But I wouldn't say they have nothing unless they can specify the map from the natural numbers into big lambda because there's so much else quite illuminating about quantum theory that their overall collection of ideas and results gives. Yeah, let's take one slide that I see as making the, the point, which is this one. So from, from my point of view, which is largely mathematical, the, the only difference between, so now you, you now see a slide called case studies. Right, yeah. Right, so the only difference between the hidden variable theory and standard quantum mechanics is outcome function x from n to two for the hidden variable theorists should factor over lambda and for quantum mechanics doesn't. Yeah. And if they don't describe this factorization explicitly, then again, what do they have? I mean, they, 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 they use this lambda without actually describing it in a way. So you, you imagine this, this triangular diagram I now have in mind, right. x factors right. over lambda, right. and they don't describe it. They don't give the factorization of the function x. What, what, what do they do? Uh, no, well, I mean, it's, it, I mean, sorry, I'll shut, the last thing I'll say, whatever happens. It, it, what it, there are other parts of their formalism, like the guidance equation and the explicit non-locality, but depending upon the position of the twin particle in the other wing of the experiment, and the you know Hamilton Jacobi type equation, yeah. the quantum potential. I mean, there's just so much else in their formalism that when you first read it, it seems an illuminating alternative, but it's certainly not going to produce the factorization of of in the diagram you're now requesting of them. 
No, yeah, so, so one might disagree, and it's good that I state my assumptions. Yeah. And so one of the reasons they derided von Neumann for it is in a way also that he stated his assumption of linearity. He did it very explicitly. He says it's an assumption. And I also, at least I state my assumptions. Yeah, no, well, all honor to you, Professor Lanzmann. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, I see Carl had his hand, so let's go to Carl now. And then if we have time, we'll come back to Jacob and perhaps Jeremy or Eric. Well, so I, I won't have to say much because I, my question was basically what Jeremy uh, just pressed cloth on. But I, let me just try to add one little thing. I mean, um, since you, it seems to me you have to use to, to, to make your theorem work. And, and, and I think that it, it is true that um, you you are presupposing that um, the hidden variable theory is kind of a global uh, uh, theory because um, if you want to get uh, the outcome of a whole infinite sequence, you've got to basically have the initial condition. Uh, the way the Bohmians do it is you, you give me the initial condition of all the particles and then I tell you what happens. So if there's going to be in, in the history of the world this infinite sequence of quantum coin flips, then that's built into the initial condition it has to be a global thing. Um, uh, and I wonder whether uh, Bohmian has to commit to the existence even of, um, of models of, of their theory in which infinite sequences of quantum experiments happen. It's not clear to me that that, that even makes sense. No, that, 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 that's right, but, but they can't even answer the question for finite runs. 